to the first show. Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, thank you very much, dear Joe. Um, I have been given a special privilege to invite the next guest here on stage and introduce him to you. Everybody knows him, and those who do generally appreciate a lot what he has to say. Apparently, as far as I heard, ticket sales here in Vienna went through the roof after news of his appearing here at Darwin Circle spread in the city. And all this happened at a point in time when it was not apparent yet how crucial and how vital the presence um, of Karl Theodor zu Gutenberg or KTG would turn out to be a special especially in light of the Bundestag elections in neighboring Germany, which happened just about four, day, five days ago, four days ago. An election which can be already now be as surmised as historic, for the elections marked, on the one hand, a turning point within the political landscape of the Federal Republic of Germany, and on the other hand, it also marked an increasingly urgent desire for a kind of generational change within the political ranks of Germany. So our next guest found himself of the eye, in the eye of actually many hurricanes. One, one hurricane was that in Florida, and the other one was the hurricane of this year's election campaign. He informed hundreds, many hundreds of guests at political discussions. He was firing up many more supporters in a lot of beer tents all over Bavaria and Germany, I guess. Uh, he battled in front of millions of, uh, view, of viewers on television, and subsequently he hurried back to New York City. New York City, that's the place where Kati Gutenberg has been living for the past several years, and it is also the place where he manages a very successful consulting firm, Spitzberg Partners, right? This morning, Kati, just about an hour ago, has arrived from New York to talk to us about the future, about the future of Germany's politics, about the future of geopolitics, as mentioned, and the future of societies in the face of the digital revolution which is currently taking place. And perhaps also to talk about his own political future. We shall see. Ladies and gentlemen, please may I ask you now for a big round of applause for the former Minister of Economic Affairs and Defense of Germany and currently, as I said, a consultant and successful entrepreneur, KTG. Thank you very much. <laughs> So, you want us to sit here? Okay. So, first of all, thanks for being here, Katiki. I know it has been a thanks long for way for, to travel from New York to Vienna for a 25-minute talk. It, um, it's worthwhile. It's um, already seeing the combination of a DJ, the Kaiser, and these screens over here <laughs> would never happen in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't want to comment on that right now. Um, <laughs> But, um, and actually it's a great program uh, they've put together here, and, uh, and since you hadn't had the chance to applaud for that, I think Alex Karb on stage, Katja Gutenberg on stage, and many others, why don't you give an applause for the guys who organized all that? <laughs> so, Kati, I mean, first questions are very, very profane questions. Um, Please comment on the results of the recent election. I mean, we talked about digital stuff as well, but I mean, it's just four days ago. You're one of the players who are quoted all the time in various newspapers. What's your comment on that, what happened in Germany? Lovely question for someone with a jet lag. <laughs> so, a couple of thoughts. First of all, I'm baffled, Dominic, by those who respond to the German elections by saying, or by, as, let's say, a everything's fine attitude. To be honest, I think almost nothing is fine after these elections. It's the first time that we have a far-right party, the AFD, in the German parliament that's not only consisting of far-right characters, but also of a remarkable, remarkable group of lunatics. We are facing now only one viable coalition constellation, which is described with the lovely term Jamaica. And a lot of people would only describe it as a three-party coalition. In reality, it will be a four-party coalition, because also my party, the CSU, will be, let's say, a very distinguished 
part in that, in that very setup. And if we take this constellation, the overall constellation into account, on one hand, a seven-party Bundestag, a potential coalition of four parties, the overall challenges we are facing on the global stage, on the European level, I wouldn't say that these are all sublime preconditions for stability. And that's the mildest phrase I can find right now. So, interesting times without a question, but uh, far from being a fine result after last Sunday. So, a couple of days ago, you gave an interview to Bloomberg, which was heavily quoted in Germany, because it was interpreted as criticism uh, of Angela Merkel. Did you want to criticize her, in yes or no? I was, I was asked about what I saw as the reasons for the outcome for the conservative parties. And, and the point I've made was that we have to be clear that we have seen a remarkable defeat of the so-called centrist parties in Germany. So that's true for the CDU, CSU, but also for the SPD. So just telling the wider public that it's great, we've been re-elected, and it's wonderful, it's on us to form a government, is certainly true, but, but. there's, but, but, but there's more behind that. And I thought that Bloomberg would not fall on any recognition grounds in Germany. I was entirely wrong about that. But um, it's, it's, it's probably was more an observation of someone who was also a voter. And yes, a tiny bit involved in the last few weeks in this, in this, in this, in this overall I mean, that, that's circus. nicely put, a tiny, bit, a tiny bit involved. You were heavily involved. Three you, weeks. You, you were speaking for, within three weeks to thousands of people. Uh, 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 you fought for your party, for the CSU. So many people were asking the question, um, why doesn't he return to politics then? <laughs> why just for three weeks? Why am I not surprised by that question? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know. No, certainly you don't. <laughs> So I returned for three weeks, and that's what I made clear way before I agreed to the request of Horst Seehofer doing that. And it was meant as a support for my party, also as a support for a re-election of the chancellor. And despite all critical elements of afterwards, now it's, uh, I'm still happy that we do have the chancellor forming the next government without a question. And and I think she'll succeed in doing that think because so? I, I think so because it's, it's, it cannot be in, anyone in, in anyone's interest to, to more or less open-handedly slide into new elections or some kind of a stalemate that will last forever. Having said that, Dominic, I think we are facing now the most, the most complex and complicated coalition talks we have seen for decades, because these parties, some of these parties really come literally from different planets. And, and so Berlin is now turning into a big Mid-Eastern bazaar where you'll see carpet dealers and camel dealers and, 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 and with, let's say, the aim to come to some kind of a compromise. So I've now successfully evaded your question about my return to politics. I'm going to answer it again. Um, I'm going to... So I've done the three weeks, and I've recognized a certain amount of hyperventilation in the media, also amongst some loving fellow party members. And my take on, on that very question is, I've had a shot a few years ago in politics. I blew it. And I think it's now on others to navigate these stormy seas we are facing, we are facing right now. It's, um, will I stay silent in the future? God, no. But, um, but I'm now in this lucky situation that I could just 
speak my mind, that I couldn't care less if someone appreciates yes or no my more or less qualified and clever remarks. Usually it's less qualified remarks. And I don't give a damn any longer whether someone likes that or not. And that's quite a comfortable situation. So for what reason should I be back in politics? To create a heart attack at, at the, for, 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 for an ambitious chap in Nuremberg? Probably not. It's um, to ruin a life that I have regained in the last few years? Probably not. So, so the right hashtag for the heart attack moment is Markus Söder, right? I think okay. you're wrong. Yeah. So we don't want to bore uh, Austrians with, with German affairs. However, there's one thing that is kind of connected uh, between the situation as it used to be in Austria, from an outsider's view, um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, and the situation in Germany. So what, to what extent the election results, or in other words, what can Germans learn from Austria with regards to how to deal with a new party on the far right? Seriously? Learn? From Austria <laughs> that has a far right party that is already, I think, 25 years on stage, that has, if the current polls are correct, I think twice as much um, percentage points as the AFD in Germany. Well, let's, let's put it the other way around. I think the learning effect is one, what not to do. And one of the things that I think one of the few positive elements of last, week's, last weekend's election is that the construct of the Grand Coalition, which is not unknown to our Austrian friends here, has come to an end because it's a truism that these constellations feed the extremes. And, and good news is that on one hand, the um, social democrats now have time in Germany to find an oxygen tent and to regain the necessary strength to become, again, an equally as necessary voice in the exchange, in the democratic exchange of opinions. Secondly, it's not the AFD that will be the largest opposition party in, Bundestag, in the Bundestag, which I would consider as being a disaster. Mm. So from that point of view, lessons learned from over here is probably get rid of grand coalitions after a while. And how to deal with the far right, I don't know how many lessons we can take because you still have a party here with 20 plus percent at least. And it's on us now in Germany to make clear that it's not enough to stay silent about this new movement as it was the strategy of some strategists in the German parties, but to confront them openly, to confront them in regards of their coquettishness with people who are openly racist, people who are openly anti-Semitic, people who are using a language we have heard last time 80 years ago in our country. And those are things we have to make absolutely clear. And at the same time, we also have to confront the AFD with their more sophisticated political approach regarding their ideas about Europe, regarding their ideas about immigration, all the other things. That's something where we have to confront them intellectually, politically, but not to keep them in some kind of a corner and at the same time giving those who voted for them a feeling of humiliation and a feeling of being somehow left out. So we have to take them seriously and we have to wage that kind of discussion and debate. That's, I think, the only way to outwit them mm. at the end of the day. And, and I can only hope that that's been taken into account now when we are facing this new Bundestag and a new culture within the Bundestag. You've been living in the United States for the, almost five years now, right? Five, six years. Six years, okay. Um, how has this time changed your views on Europe? Quite a bit. Tell it's, us. If, you, if you're in the, in the political hamster wheel, your view in Europe is more or less driven by romantic 
let's say, romantic phrases we have heard again and again and again and again about the achievements of the European Union, about, about, about certain elements of the European Union. So we were all always pointing at the peace dividend, at the four freedoms, at things people took and take for granted in the meanwhile. And it was also guided by, 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 by thoughts that was on a, driven by an ad hoc basis decision-making process. If you're in this political spectrum, you have to take Europe into account more or less every half hour for a decision. You have exactly half an hour time to form a substantial opinion about, which is part of the ridiculous development in politics. So looking at Europe from the outside um, brought me to, let's say, two conclusions. One was that I became a more committed European than before. Than before partly due to the fact that I was constantly bashed by, the, by, by my American friends about the deficits and the idiocies of the European Union, and a lot of them didn't have a clue how the European Union actually really functions, which is also true for a good number of people in Europe. But, it's, um, but, but that was one of the things where when you, when you have to start to defend the European Union towards Americans, you become more committed. And, and so that's the emotional part of it. The intellectual part of it is that looking at it from the outside, seeing, having more time to dive into the deficits, the structures, the um, founding myth, and all the other things of the European Union, um, left me with the second conclusion that I would say it is probably one of the most valuable things we have created in European history is the EU on one hand, may sound banal, but secondly, it's also probably one of the most vulnerable things we have created and that we are dancing on extremely thin ice still when it comes to the future of Europe. And, and that we have to, regardless where we live in this world, we have, to, we have to stay engaged. So let's be more precise. What are the main issues that Europe, in your opinion, has to resolve to be prepared for the future? And let's not just talk about the next 10 years. Uh, um, the Bundeskanzler just mentioned um, he's traveling to Tallinn tonight. Um, there's a very important meeting today and tomorrow. Um, uh, so what are the, the, the next immediate steps that should be taken in your view? Steps, by the way, that need to be taken with inclusion of Germany. And that's also one of, the, um, one of the questionable outcomes of last Sunday's decision that Germany will be more or less distracted for the next few weeks by the coalition talks without giving any substantial impulses towards the wider European questions, specifically referring, referring, referring to, to Macron's speech yeah. yesterday, or the, with the general, day before yesterday. Day before yesterday, the day before yesterday, which was, I think, finally, a wide-reaching and very substantial approach of how the European Union could look like in the future. It was, I think, meant as a starting point for a necessary debate, and at the same time for him as a reconfirmation of his own stability at home, because he's waging a couple of necessary reforms in France. He's actually currently Schröderizing, as I would say. So doing the reforms Chancellor Schröder did in 2005 in Germany against his own chaps. So, so Germany probably won't be part of that discussion for the next few months because we are distracted by our own turmoil at home, which is a pity. On the other hand, it's a debate that has finally started, and a debate that includes much more than just the day-to-day -day politics we grew tired about in Brussels and, 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 and on a summit here, the next summit here, the next summit here. So first of all, I think, without repeating the two-hour speech now of, of, of Macron, I think it is necessary to look at the structural elements of the European Union and whether these structures do reflect yes or no. European realities. We've been living in a dream for decades, and, 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 and we've also coped with certain illusions regarding, regarding Europe. Europe was never a Europe of same speeds. Europe never was a Europe of equals. 
in that regard. Neither the Europe of the six, of the nine, of the 12, of the 15, all the way up to the 28 minus potentially seven. Europe is de facto a Europe of concentric circles. Europe is de facto a Europe of different speeds. It has created already its own circles or speed elements with the Eurozone on one hand or the Schengen group or other things, but it isn't reflected in the treaties. So as long as we have romantic, nostalgic treaties not reflecting the reality, I wonder how we could come to the next step to convince a wider public of the necessary steps to cope with the realities. It's not going to happen. And so therefore, the structural debate, I think, is correct. It needs to be led. Whether it's the solution Macron is proposing is a different question. He's, he's actually asking for the maximum from his right, side. Right, but the impetus is... But it's good mm. to ask for the maximum because then it actually has to come into a debate, into a discussion that is prolific. From the structures, we come to the question, what has Europe, what needs, what, what needs to be tackled on a European level? I think um, the whole foreign policy and security level has never evolved on the European stage to a degree that Europe could sufficiently handle the threats and the reasons also for refugee crises and all the other things. So that has never been developed properly. Of course, because of nationalistic interests, you still have and you have growingly in some European countries. On the other hand, because it's traditionally something like, let's keep that stronghold of foreign policy on the national level and not move it to the European level, which leads to a race of different opinions of different strategies towards our neighborhood, maybe Turkey, maybe the African continent, maybe the policies towards Russia and all the other things. What we urgently need is a European foreign policy that is functional, a European security policy that is functional. I like the idea of European security structures, also the discussion about a European army in the far future. All these things are necessary steps to discuss and actually to install and to get done at a certain point. Thirdly, we're talking about the digital landscape and, and, and the digital developments. I don't think that it is enough to only have in Europe a debate of what to avoid and what to hinder. And how, of course you need regulation. But if you look at the European level, you very often get the impression it's about how can we get rid of certain things instead of how can we actually produce us in a way that we are on a level playing field with the large and creative and productive nations around the globe. One is the US, one is China, India is emerging in that regard, and Europe is a fragmented digital, I wouldn't say disaster, but a digital light, fragmented lightweight. Carpet. Yeah. yeah. I, was, I was just wondering why Emmanuel Macron, it took him two hours to explain the same, same things, you just needed three minutes. Um, Cathy. He's French. Um, <laughs> 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 the, um, at the beginning of our talk, you, you basically said no to a possible return in the near future into German politics. Uh, so you're probably focusing more on your, on your other life as an entrepreneur in New York. What are you actually doing? What is, what's, what is your business model? And, and how is it intertwined with the digital world? So... One of the things I figured out when I left politics was, first of all, the topics where I always pretended to have knowledge as a politician, but where I was utterly clueless. And one was certainly the intersection of the political world with the developments we see in the technological and the digital space. And it was quite obvious how quickly these two planets are drifting apart instead of growing together. And then I figured out that tech companies and digital companies were burning billions of dollars because they didn't have an idea of the geopolitical impact of their technologies of cross-cultural issues that may emerge from a technology that they would roll out in a different background or a different, different part of the world, 
and of course then coming from their regulatory issues. So as we started off with setting up an advisory company, we said, okay, we will give you that backing because we, we, we saw that there was nobody moving in this field with the necessary knowledge. And then it didn't take long that, um, that uh, in big investment and VC firms came and said, okay, you have a due diligence comp component we don't have. Could you help us with this or that investment? And then we started also to invest in companies which we had already been advising for a while and we knew well enough so that we minimized our risk quite tremendously. So it's a, it's a combination of investment and advising companies that would move into different markets, maybe from the US to Europe, from the US to Asia, or from Asia to the US, or the other way around, or from Israel to Europe, to know what they have to expect from a geopolitical point of view, from a cross-cultural point of view, and all the others. And then old industry even came and said, okay, here we are in an M&A process. We don't get the questions behind the tech company we are looking at at the very moment, can you help us with these questions? So that was the third pillar that we built up there. And we have grown a bit. We have now people on eight places around the globe. And, um, and I'm having a lot of fun doing this. And, and sometimes I'm probably politically more efficient in doing this than I ever was in office. So why the hell should I go back? It's, um, it's, it's making me happy what I'm doing. You're now, obviously right a man of many talents. So let's to, 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 to finish now, um, let's play a short game together. Um, I, will, I will start a sentence, and you, Kati, will complete it, okay? Just five times or six times. If I were, I, I, your silence, I take it as a yes, right? So <laughs> if, if, if I were to be in Angela Merkel's position, <laughs> um, then I would start growing Mariana to please the Greens. In that current situation, I would probably turn my lawn into a coal mine to please the FDP. <laughs> and I would start wearing a dundle to please the CSU. <laughs> so, talking about the CSU. <laughs> talking, about, talking about your own party. I would not worry about the future of my party, the CSU, if... Angela Merkel starts wearing a dental. <laughs> no, but also, if you would find an upper limit, an Obergrenze, for politicians that only see their personal career as the main point of their actions and non-actions. It is worthwhile to take a flight from New York City to Vienna for a 28-minute appearance on stage because... Wow. Well, as Austrian Airlines still doesn't have Wi-Fi, <laughs> it gave me an opportunity to... Reflect upon life. To have eight hours without being molested by the tweets of the clown in the White House. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, Kathy Gutenberg. <laughs>